You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fari Puya. In this week's program, we'll be interviewing Benjamin David, the president of the Atheist Society at Warwick University. We'll be talking about Ashura and mourning in Iran, which is also called Hossein Party by young people. Uh, we'll discuss the issue of handshakes in Iran and how they are very sexual, according to the Islamic regime of Iran. We'll talk about ISIS's Bureau of Sex Slavery, outrageous, as well as a fatwa on traditional dance in Saudi Arabia, and of course, uh, the wonderful protests of Jews and Arabs in Israel. Stay with us. This week that passed, there's a lot of uh, things that have taken place uh, which we'd like to discuss with you. One of them, of course, is the fact that this is the month of Muharram. It's a month of mourning. And of course, the 10th day of Muharram is Ashura, and it's a day when one of the Shia Imams, Hussein, was uh, slaughtered and killed in Karbala with 70-something of his followers. So it's a day of mourning where people go and self-flagellate, Hussein, 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 Hussein. And of course, you know, they've said, the Islamic regime of Iran has said that people have to be sad for the whole month. Nobody's yes. allowed to do anything fun. And, you, you know, suddenly there is this sort of <laughs> dark Hossein. clouds of sort of sadness. Yeah, you've got to pretend that this you've is such a, such a <laughs> terrible time. 1400 years ago, somebody died and they were in, in fighting between different sects of um, Islam. But in, in, the reality is that people uh, um, they pretend they're very sad because of the um, oppression that there is. Uh, but young people, that. young people do something else. Yeah, it's funny because it's actually called Hossein Party because people use that opportunity to go and meet with others and, and have a lovely time because that's one time when people can come out in the public space and yeah. uh, mingle and mix and, and dance and have fun. And Reza Moradi <laughs> was mentioning that the price of alcohol and all the well, videos, everything. Well, of course, because uh, it's yeah, illegal course, in Iran. Suddenly yeah. it shoots up. Yeah. You've got you to pick up because everybody wants to have fun in those days. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And it's funny because Rouhani has said that all freedom-seeking people around the world love Imam Hussein and the Ashura <laughs> culture. And what's despicable about this culture is the fact that because it, it's, it's centered around self-flagellation. So you have people hitting themselves with chains, completely bloody. And not only that, there's some, so many disturbing images of children having, um, you know, uh, bloody faces because uh, blunt swords have been used to, to sort of flagellate children. To public abuse of children. It is, yeah. And sort of, uh, you know, sucking out any joy from society. Yeah, yeah. Just horrible scenes to see. Yeah, definitely. Now, uh, you know, co continuing on the issue of Iran, it's really... Um, un uh, you know, it's upsetting, but in a sense, it's co comic as well. I mean, it's like a tragic comedy, you know, where you've got people being sentenced in Iran for various things that are just so absurd. One of them is this Iranian film director. He's award-winning film director, K uh, Kayvon Karimi. He's been sentenced to six years and 223 lashes for insulting sanctities why? Because he intended to portray a kissing scene in a film of his. He didn't do it, he intended to do it. Yes, or oh, there was a poet who, one of the, uh, Shahin Najabi, one of the Iranian singers, 10 years after she'd uh, written a poem, he sang it in one of his, uh, his songs. She's been arrested for something she actually she wrote 20 year, 10 years before that. And well, she's, her name is Fatima Ekhtasari, she, and another um, artist, Mehdi Musavi, they've been given nine years and six months and 99 lashes, and he's been given 11 years and 99 uh, lashes, respectively, on charges also of insulting the sacred, um, and for the social criticisms that have been expressed in their poetry. But what's uh, most absurd is the fact that when uh, the, the poet was outside of Iran in Sweden, she shook hands with some men. And as That's a dangerous. result, she's been charged with illegitimate sexual relationships short of adultery. This is dangerous, Maria. This is, you get nine months for this. Was it nine good, years, was six months. Was it good months. for you? It was good for me. I don't know. <laughs> Turn your eyes away. We just shook hands. I mean, seriously, this is 
what these rules mean for people's lives. And, you know, it, it's absurd, but you're talking about years in prison, flogging, which is torture of people, merely yeah. for writing poetry. And, and this is a new trend that a lot of the artists uh, and a lot of uh, poets in recent months under the new um, government, uh, they've been arrested for silly charges like this. No, it's not a new government, but what do you mean the new government? Under uh, Rouhani. I mean, recently yeah. this is a new yeah. trend yeah. they yeah. picked up to silence the um, um, artists. And it seems that there have just been long-term sentences. Mm. Um, early this week we heard that um, Jafar Azimzadeh, one of the leading uh, trade unionists in Iran, mm. he's been sentenced for six years because so. He dared to sign a petition and organize a petition for better wages in mm, Iran. Outrageous, Six years sorry. for that. And we've also got uh, this artist, Atene Fahredani, which we had talked about before, where she had been sentenced to 12 years for doing a cartoon. Uh, she also, it seems, because she shook hands with her lawyer, she was given virginity and pregnancy tests as well. So, I mean, it's just, you know, how outrageous and how perverse is this look at the relationship between men and women that even a handshake is deemed to be so um, disgusting in their eyes you know and of course uh, we you know we heard so many wonderful things about the Rouhani government we always said from the start that you know this is uh, there's no real reform possible under an Islamic regime and we've seen now that executions have been stepped up in Iran we've got now uh, more than 800 people have been executed since the beginning of 2015 an average of three executions a day um, we, you know, outrageous. Iran is one of the execution capitals of the world. Uh, and finally, I mean, I think the, the, one of the most shocking things we've heard is about ISIS's Bureau of Sex Slavery. They've got a Bureau of Sex Slavery. And they've got, they've got a table of prices for different uh, category of slaves and women. They've got different categories of slaves uh, and including cattle. They, these are all on various price lists. And just to tell you that for 40 to 50-year-old women, uh, the price is $41. 30 to 40-year-old women is $62. 20 to 30-year-old women are $82 and one to nine year old children are $165. I mean, it, it's not, I think there are no words to say how disgusting and despicable uh, this, this, um, the ISIS is, as well as this entire movement, anti-woman, anti, -woman, anti, -woman, and, anti -human. and anybody wants to justify and support them, apologize for them, it's guilty how, no, of how supporting could, this. How just... could they? How could they? Saad al-Hajri, he's a mufti from Asir. He has issued a fatwa banning a traditional dance of the region. Now have a look at this really lovely dance in Saudi, it's a Saudi, from Saudi Arabia, watch this. What did you think of that dance? 
quite fun to watch, wasn't it? But I mean, there's a movie that's rhythm. upset it's about it. It's a rhythm, it's all made, it's like but the, it's, it's, it's all fun in terms of yeah. rhythm. It's got rhythm. Fun if you're bored or something. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> this this is do. music from the southwest of Saudi Arabia, a sea region. And somebody said, actually, people who are shaking, they, they shake themselves like women. Ah, so the, the fatwa is against them because they shake like women and you shouldn't shake like women because that mufti, when he sees them shaking like that, it's like that handshake. He gets in trouble. It's the handshake. It's just <laughs> dangerous, yeah? And what's dangerous. happened to another um, uh, agency, the bigger brother of fatwa organization? They're upset. They're upset so that this a, little mufti here has given a fatwa. Yeah, and, it's, <laughs> and, and they said, look, you're not allowed to give fatwa. We have the right to give fatwa. <laughs> but they're, they're not worried about the fact that what he said is misogynist and anti-woman. The body that actually is encroaching in the patch of giving fatwa because he's charged with this. But have you noticed how even when they give a fatwa against men, it's got something to do with women. So yeah. like, it's men, but because you look like a woman, yes. that's the end of All it. All fatwas are anti-woman. They are. They are. Yeah. And anti-human. Uh, the slice of life this week is this wonderful protest of Jews and Arabs in Israel on the 17th of October. And it's just, you know, we're going to show you some photos from that protest. And it's quite a lovely thing to see, given all of the violence and bloodshed that is so much part of that region it's and country. It's beautiful. Arab and the uh, uh, Jews from Jerusalem together, the center of Jerusalem, they stand together shoulder to shoulder. It's a lot you know, end of this trouble is for us to be able to live together. That's the solution to the, you know, the whole uh, violence that exists in, uh, in Middle East. Um, and this is a lesson for people who support one extreme side to the other, or this uh, government against the other group, or yeah. this is a solution. Yeah, I mean, you, you do hear people either saying we're all Hamas, or definitely not, or they'll say, they'll side with the Israeli state and its occupation and close their eyes on what's happening. And we've always said, we side with the people of Israel and Palestine. And I think one of the, you know, if you read the statement that they've read, they've, they uh, um, issued on the day of the protest, they said, we Jews and Arabs will not surrender to despair or to fear. On Saturday evening, we stand together in Jerusalem, the heart of the cycle of bloodshed, which is also the place from which any solution must be begin. We will demand freedom for both people, equal rights and equality before the law. This is the only possible solution to violence, killing and hatred. And, so and this it's is a lesson for shameless men. Yeah, and the all the apologies. Sort of, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, don't mention his name. I just felt <laughs> queasy. So well done to you guys. Solidarity with you. Now, earlier I did an interview with Benjamin David, who is the president of the Warwick Atheist Seculars and Humanist Society. And it was about this recent debacle where the student union there had initially denied me uh, permission to go and speak at and, the invitation of the atheists. How dare they? Um, and they had basically uh, accused me of being inflammatory and, you know, they were concerned that I would incite hatred if I went on campus. Uh, whereas it's actually the Islamists that do that day in and day out, and they're quite happy with them. So um, Benjamin David is, is the president of the society that really, you know, stood firm, defended free expression, and, you know, the student union quickly apologized, and I'm going to be speaking there, uh, actually the day that this program is broadcast. So um, what, what's great is that I had a chance to really talk to him and ask him what he thought about the situation, what his views were. Listen to this interview and then we'll come back uh, and talk some more. Stay with us. Benjamin David, welcome to the program. Uh, good news that you've had a victory uh, at Warwick University. Tell us about that. Right, yes. Um, it's fantastic news that we've uh, secured a victory for yourself to come to the University of Warwick and for free speech and of course success for our society. Um, as I'm sure most people probably know, um, 
that you were, of course, uh, barred from coming to our university because the war against you cited that you could uh, be highly inflammatory and you could incite hatred, which is a, a part of book um, accusation. And um, it caused us, of course, to, uh, of course, we made, I made an appeal and it was an answered. And then, of course, then you and I took it upon ourselves to uh, make that public. And so many people got involved and uh, trying to overturn this very heinous decision that just like a complete infringement of free speech. And um, yeah, so numerous media outlets covered it, The Guardian, The Independent, and there was a complete, complete Twitter explosion. And um, it was amazing just how many luminaries and dignitaries, you know, they chimed in and, and they were really, really, really supportive. And, uh, and finally, um, the work SU retracted their their initial barring of you and um, secured our victory, which is fantastic. And uh, of course, Warwick, atheist secularist, the King Miss, for which I'm, you know, I preside over, um, are really looking forward to uh, to seeing you in the end of October. Do you think there's ever any reason why um, criticism of religion, for example, should shouldn't be allowed? Mm -hmm. Why there should be restrictions on free expression? Um, I think the only time um, that kind of uh, expression should be restricted would be if there is ample evidence of inciting hatred. I mean, in your case, definitely not, you know, there's no evidence at all to suggest that you are inciting hatred, but I think um, it is important to have a, uh, to have a, yeah, to have, I could say, complete unrestricted um, expression criticizing religion, but I mean, I think in itself, um, restriction, uh, Criticizing religion is a very good thing because you need to have a narrative that is almost multifaceted. You need to hear different sides of the story because essentially, if you have this single narrative, you can't um, you can't discern on the one hand um, extolling independence of thought from subservience. You need different you need different nar narratives in order to see your own position to expose your your own views to criticism to hear the other story and this is really important especially in university settings which are supposed to be bastions of, of education really academic education and academic freedom and of course barring any criticism of particular religion I think it precludes and also undermines the kind of thing that universities should be. Yeah especially with universities I mean why do you think it's so key particularly there for free expression to be respected? Because um, many students are at a very young, impressionable age, and I think at that young age in particular, um, students should be exposed to different narratives. Because it's all, too, all, it's all too easy for students, when they're given a single narrative, to, uh, to identify that narrative and to not question it, even being hostile to opposing views. And that is, I mean, it's very, very difficult, and you need to, uh, very difficult, but very dangerous. And students need to be um, exposed to different narratives in order to actually discern the values and the arguments that, that different narratives have in relation to other narratives. And this is really important. But of course, if you're just purely exposed to a single um, interpretation of a single issue, then you're not, you're not going to be able to have a well-balanced, reasonable position on anything, which is, which is highly toxic. How much do you think um, criticism of religion has uh, been important for you personally as well in your own life? Um, it's been very, very important to me on a more personal basis because um, there were there was a period of my time that I, in my life, sorry, that I was um, terrified of the idea of, of criticizing the religion that I was, which of course was the uh, I used to be a Jehovah's Witness, and um, it took me a very long time to have the confidence and the tenacity to stand up and say, you know, look, I don't identify, I don't agree with the things being um, espoused by that religion. Um, and of course, when I did stand up, um, you know, it, it was against all odds. There was, there was a lot of discrimination that I faced and it took a lot of confidence for me to do that. Um, fortunately, though, in our society, most people are, you know, in families and friends, they are, um, congenial to people if they lead their religion but however we still live in a culture today that many many people 
refuse to allow different narratives to exist, whether that be in families, whether that be in the larger communities, whether that be in university settings. And that is very noxious because basically what it does, it pushes people to live double lives. It, it, it undermines and it subverts one's own freedom to be the kind of person that they want to be, freely. And that, that's very dangerous, especially in a liberal society that we should be having right here in the, in, in the UK and in the course of the world over. Thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you. I hope you enjoyed that uh, interview with uh, Benjamin David. I think one of the key things about freedom of expression is the fact that it is meaningless without criticism of religion. And I think particularly, you know, um, when you've got religion in the public space, when you've got religion in political power, it's not a question of it being a personal religion anymore. You know, it has real implications on the lives of people and it's important to be able to challenge it, to criticize it, to make fun of it, to ridicule it. And, you know, if you can't do that, which is what's really happening for, for a while now, this, this trend towards censoring or self-censoring uh, any criticism of Islam, it's dangerous because it stops that challenge that's needed and it stops real change from taking place. And I think as Benjamin said, it has own personal impact on personal level. It actually deprives people of having the opportunity to think and reflect on uh, um, on the issues that uh, is under debate and discussion. And I think that applies to every single individual. So by actually depriving people, it doesn't matter how absurd the views are. But at the same time, it has a social implication because usually vested interest, religious and powerful institution, they don't want people to question them. So it actually protects the vested interests and the powerful. Yeah, definitely. Tell us what you think about these important issues. And we look forward, of course, as always, to hearing from you. We love seeing all your comments, uh, both in YouTube as well as on Facebook and elsewhere. Keep uh, being in touch with us. And thank you to several new patrons that we've got from for, for our Patreon fund. So we really appreciate that. It's going up slowly but surely. We hope you enjoyed this week's program. We look forward to seeing you again, same time and same place. Goodbye from me. Bye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.